Officer, I'm seeing some looks like we have a situation here.
progress. Officer on scene, looks like we have a situation here.
progress.
progress.
You know when a police chief really feels his power? When he hires and fires people? When he throws folks in jail? When he's bossing everyone around all morning? No, there's no power there. Just bureaucratic red tape. Like directing traffic. Not that it's all bad. No, I feel it the most when people come to me with accusations. Accusations happen outside the law. They don't need to be rational or supported by evidence. They don't petition justice in the careful words of legal formality. No, an accusation is a personal cry, full of resentment or envy, a defeated moan or an angry howl. The accuser rarely imagines you'll share their resentment, their envy, their hatred. No, but they do imagine that your love of power is so strong that you'll leap to decide the fates of others, happy just to take someone's word for the facts. Businessmen accuse the gangsters, the gangsters blame our public figures, public figures denounce politicians, the politicians point to the businessmen. When it comes to accusation, there's only one rule. Don't aim too high. If you overestimate your own importance, then complaining can cost you your life. So choose the easier path. Exaggerate as far as you can and try to make your plea sound as sad and pathetic as possible. The accusation I received today sure didn't fit the normal mold. After killing Vickis Varga and routing his supporters, Sand further strengthened his already powerful authority. Even a month ago, anyone coming out against Sand would sound like a lunatic with a death wish. Today, it's the same thing as suicide. But the letter I'm holding in my hands directly connects Henry Sand, lieutenant of the Sand Mafia family, to the reported death of successful banker John Pazzi. Henry has a daughter, Marianne, a dancer, and apparently it all started with her. One day, Marianne danced in the title role of a production of Giselle, and Henry, proud father that he is, brought the whole family to the premiere along with some of the family's business partners. Among their guests was the young banker John Pozzi. He couldn't keep his eyes off Marianne, but she ended up brushing him off. In response, Pozzi ambushed her one night after rehearsal, pulled her into his limousine and had his way with the poor girl. After that, gentleman that he was, he drove the girl home and threatened that if she told anyone what happened, her mother would get the same treatment. But her father still managed to shake the truth out of Marianne, and he decided to take his revenge. Of course, Henry knew he couldn't just go with his instincts and put a bullet in Potsy in broad daylight. The rich bastard was too important for business, and Henry is neck deep in the family business, overseeing transportations for the San Mafia. He knew about every delivery delay, every car, and every shop. It was mostly thanks to Henry that the whole sand operation rolls so smoothly. Henry has free access to all their off-book cars, and a tar black motive. Yeah, he could easily arrange the death of John Pozzi as a drunken, late-night hit-and-run. But Henry Sand is smarter than that. If this story about Pozzi is true, he'd more likely go to the boss and ask permission. I'd have figured this letter the ramblings of a retired gangster looking to spice up his life with little excitement. The way the letter started, My dear little old cop cake. I had every mind to toss it in the trash. But something else got my attention. They're rarely ever signed. But this one ended Robespierre. And I doubt it's an imposter. No one would go against the most powerful group in the city hoping to hide behind the name of some prankster clown. Like everyone else, I had no idea who Robespierre was or what he wanted. But there was no doubt that this guy was more than a little crazy. An arrogant psychopath. Could be dangerous. Definitely worth looking into.
Oh, Jack, you always come back so late. What's wrong? Bad news? Good news, Jack. Laura is ready. Ready how? She's coming back? When? Not that fast, Jack. Laura's ready to talk. But if she's ready to talk, she's getting ready to come back. You just need to find the right words. Y you can find the right words, right, Jack? I'm not an idiot. I didn't ask for this, Jack. It's the middle of the night, and I'm alone on an old farm, 40 minutes away from anywhere, sat on a creaky porch, and now I'm getting snapped at. I came here so you could personally promise me that you'll be able to find the right words. So let's try again. You can find the right words, right, Jack? I can find the right words, Mrs. Markham. That's good to hear. Tomorrow night at 3 o'clock at the Octopus Restaurant. You know it? Yeah, but it's closed at night. Oh, I've arranged for them to be open. Don't be late. But don't come too early, either. Mrs. Markham? Yeah? I should probably offer you some tea or something before you go. <laughs> Do you have any tea? No. Good night, Jack.
According to Mrs. Markham, I was supposed to spend all day thinking up the right words. But to my surprise, I did my best work when I shut my head off. I didn't even want to think why Laura decided we'd meet at 3 o'clock in the morning, and in a restaurant we'd never gone to. I didn't know what to tell her, and something tells me she's no more ready for this meeting than I am. By nightfall, I finally stopped worrying. The right words would come when they were needed. And if they don't come at all, then so be it. I've heard said, when you're knocked out by a single blow, you don't have time to feel any pain. Well, that's a lie. It's painful as hell. Every day I spent in that coma, the pain was unbearable. Yeah, I heard about that already. But what if they decide to spill it to the papers? We need to start thinking now about covering our asses. I know people who can deal with this, but they'll need at least a week. Plus, if we want to... Lieutenant Stat, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I have Jack Boyd on the line. Who? Jack Boyd, sir. He's calling from the hospital. <sighs> Gibson, I'll call you back. Don't do anything without my team. Jack, well, wow. I didn't know you were awake. The doctor said you could be in that coma for months, even years. How are you feeling? Tell me who's in control, Martin. I don't think I follow you. For God's sake, Martin, tell me it's you running the department and not some stooge from the mayor's office. Uh, yes, Jack. I am performing the duties of the police chief, but the new man's coming on Saturday, Kevin Paulson. He... Kevin Paulson? Yes, it's the guy from the... I know who Kevin Paulson is. Now listen carefully, Martin. I'm coming back to work. I'm Freeburg's police chief, and it's gonna stay that way for another four months. Now you get on the phone and do whatever needs to be done. You run into any problems, threaten them with the media, court, or blackmail. But I don't think they'll give you any trouble. The mayor knows it's easier to just wait until the winter than deal with a scandal. Oh, and assemble a press conference. Listen, Jack, I know the truth is on your side, but you have to take into account- Martin! How long since you transferred to my department? Uh, coming up on five years now. How many times in the last five years have you come to my birthday party? How many times have you come to the farm when I had the boys over? Uh, never had the pleasure, but... Never, because you couldn't care less. And I don't care for you either, Stet. It wasn't me who appointed you deputy, and uh, you wouldn't have been my first choice. But if you do ever come over to my house... You won't miss the big hole in my backyard. Garbage pit. 
you know, for old rubbish. A smelly hole filled with rotten furniture and other crap. So, Stet, if I even for a moment doubt your devotion, you'll go straight into that pile of trash. Maybe you'll get to catch up with some old friends. You remember Kendrick, don't you? I'll schedule the press conference for tomorrow, all right, Jack? The day after tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going shopping. No, that would be too much. Jack, what's with the outfit? You planning on- The pit in the backyard, Martin. Always remember about the pit in the backyard. Don't talk to anyone before the press conference starts. I'll try to get you on stage quickly. Kevin Paulson is here. He wanted to- Jack! I hardly recognize you. That's quite an image for a man like you. An old dog with a new trick, right? We should see each other more often. How long has it been? Last time I saw you, I fired you, Kevin. Ha! <laughs> You mean the day I resigned in protest over the corruption and lawlessness at your police department, right? Yeah, repeat that shit often enough, someday you might start believing it. You know, Jack, I'm glad that everything turned out so well. Unlike you, I've made good use of the past seven years. My new construction company keeps getting jobs from the city, and we're doing really well. I have a new house, new hobbies, even a new wife. Maybe you've met her. Shelly Rogers. Oh, Shelly Rogers. So you really are in bed with the mayor. <laughs> it's a dream come true. All my dreams have come true. Only one thing remains. To bring order to the Freeburg Police Department. <laughs> you being serious, Kevin? I'm serious as ever, Jack. I'm the most serious man you know. It's not often you see the past and the future of Freeburg Police Chiefs at the same press conference. <laughs> I hope you have time to talk, Kevin. There's something we need to discuss. Jack, the reporters, they're waiting for you. My retirement plan somehow just got turned into a circus. Fortunately, I'm pretty good at swallowing swords and jumping through burning hoops. They all seem to like it.
9-11 in progress.
Impressive recovery, Mr. Boyd. I'm still not happy about how soon you're back to work. Well, not happy as your doctor. As a resident of Freeburg, I'm immensely grateful for it. Really? <laughs> Just don't tell anyone, or they'll pull my license. Well, thank you again for coming to see me at night. Oh, well, whatever you need, Mr. Boyd. Any doctor in this town would come running any hour, day or night, you can believe me. You're not suffering from headaches. It says here that you are taking painkillers after a back injury. But the prescribed dose is enough to... A Dr. Krachinsky, you trust me? And, uh, sorry? Do you trust me? In what way, Mr. Boyd? You think I'm an honest and reasonable man, Doctor? You are joking, Mr. Boyd. Thanks to you, my wife finally agreed to buy a house here, and we decided to have children. Thanks to you, I'm not afraid to visit my patients at night. I think you are the most honest and reasonable person in the city, Mr. Boyd. Great. You see, Dr. Krachinsky, uh, I'm an addict. Mr. Boyd, is, uh, is... Well, not a drug addict in the way you might imagine. I'm not some weak-willed junkie. Sometimes I stay clean so long that the tablets stay locked in the barn so long they go past the expiration date. But there are less pleasant stories. You know what? Let's... I once took a whole bottle right there in the barn, passed out in my own vomit. I almost choked. I fought the convulsions, somehow managed to break four ribs. For two weeks, my chest was so sore I wanted to die. But for those two weeks, I kept swallowing pills. Couldn't stop. If you want, I could... Uh... I once took a dose right before a party at home. My wife, Laura, had some old friends over from college. And I didn't take that many, maybe five or six pills, but it felt like I'd taken a few hundred. I passed out while I was carrying a tray of drinks. On the way down, I knocked over a set of Laura's scented candles. The house almost burned down. The repairs took a good chunk from our savings. Mr. Boyd, if you'll allow me, I just... Uh... As you can see, Doctor, I'm well aware of the seriousness of the situation and the possible consequences. But sometimes I need the pills. I don't use the word lightly. Sometimes I've got to work on cases with more energy than I've got. I can't do it without them. And I know you want me doing my job. So tomorrow I want you to come here and bring me some tablets. Lots of tablets. Ten bottles. No, no better fifteen. Yeah, fifteen bottles. The next three months are going to be extremely difficult, Doc. I would like to discuss your... Uh, You'll bring the pills, Doctor? Uh, yes, Mr. Boyd. Yes. Very good. Look, I don't want to trouble you any further. I bet your family doesn't like you running away with me at night. I bet they'd rather I was still in that coma. <laughs>
Mr. Boyd, I'm going home. Uh, do you need anything? Oh, no, no, don't go. I need to talk to you. I won't keep you long. I just need to make one phone call and I'll be right out, okay? Of course, Mr. Boyd. <sighs> Do you know what time it is? I didn't mean, uh, well, maybe I did. Guess I'm a son of a bitch. Jack? Good Lord, Jack, I wanted to talk to you. Was wondering if you'd call. How do you feel? I'm good, Mrs. Markham. Better than ever. The back pain is gone, the insomnia is gone, my hair is growing back, and my pathological indecisiveness seems to have run off somewhere. Jack, if you think I had anything to do with that... I'll waste no more time trying to think, Mrs. Markham. Every second counts. There's a lot to do. And one of those things is finding Laura. Jack, your tone is scaring me. Good. Turns out I have a knack for that, scaring people. So, Mrs. Markham, I'm going to look for my wife, and if you somehow get in my way, I'll send a special squad to your house. First they'll throw your dog in the fire, then they'll arrest you for prostitution. What? What the hell? Prostitution? Sometimes it's necessary to invent charges. It's not like I can arrest you for being an unbearable bitch. Emma, I need a detective. Oh, of course, Mr. Boyd. What shift? No, 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 not one of ours. A private detective. Oh. Um... I know that when your father stole your mother's jewelry and left her, you hired a private investigator. You didn't go to the police. Uh, you know, Mr. Boyd, it was a family problem, and we felt that it would... I understand perfectly, Emma. You don't need to explain anything. I'm in a similar situation. As you might have heard, my wife left the house. She's missing, you could say. Uh... I'm not sure what you're... I know you've heard all about it. I want her found, but I don't want the department involved. Same reason you didn't. So I decided to hire your private detective. Think you can arrange it? Oh, of course, Mr. Boyd. I'll call him and arrange everything. And don't worry, he'll keep it a secret. Fine. Uh, what do you need from me? Well... Just gather all the information that might be useful, and put it in an envelope, bring it to me, and I'll take it to him. Good. Okay, take the day off tomorrow and get a good night's sleep. The day after tomorrow, I'll have that envelope for you.
417 in progress. Starting 
All the information about Laura, just like you asked. Mr. Boyd, keep your voice down. Someone could be listening. Oh, I'm sorry, Emma. It's my first time doing something like this. Here's the envelope. Everything's in there. Fine. Mr. Boyd, please write for Mr. Fry on this envelope and drop it in the mailbox across the street. What? I don't want this handled like it's some kind of game. Mr. Boyd, those are the rules. Now please, lower your voice. Fine. Uh, okay, Emma. I'll put this envelope in the mailbox across the street, just like you said. Wonder how that damn Mr. Fry is gonna get an envelope out of the mailbox. Talking to yourself, Mr. Boyd? And we thought we'd have to catch you at the police station. But it turns out Jack Boyd has come down to meet us personally. Do you know why we're here, Mr. Boyd? I don't even know who you are. My name is Eugene Chaffee. I'm a businessman. Rather, a restaurateur. Although I usually tell everyone I'm a businessman. Uh, which sounds better, businessman or restaurateur? Oh, I think I've heard of you. You have a restaurant and a slaughterhouse. Uh, and you serve refried veal steaks. <laughs> well, refried veal steaks isn't my only business. But perhaps it's what I'm best known for. I thought it was time we meet Mr. Boyd, and my friend here, I believe you're already acquainted. His name is Troy Star. Never heard of him. So what do you want, Mr. Chaffee? Looking for a spokesman for your beef products? I recently changed my image, and my hair... Eugene and I really want to help you, Mr. Boyd. Although after our phone call, I've had my doubts. I was making love to my wife, and you called me and told me to fuck myself. That kind of behavior is rude and inappropriate, Mr. Boyd. <laughs> I didn't mean to offend you, Mr. Starr. Just thumbing my nose at that prick mayor of ours. You keep making love to your wife, or uh, did I ruin the mood? There's a nice cafe around the corner. Spare us a couple of minutes of your time, Mr. Boyd. Lately, I've been so busy that I rarely get to sit and relax in such a nice place. And with such interesting company. Get to the point, Mr. Chaffee. I'm busy, too. In fact, I think I hear some teenagers next door robbing and raping an old woman. Maybe she's your aunt. <laughs> you see, Mr. Boyd. Good morning. What do you want? A big mug of beer. We don't serve big mugs of beer. Then a small mug of beer. We don't have beer in any size glasses. This is a family restaurant. Moms and dads come with small children. I can bring you a lollipop to suck on. Monica, where's your famous charm? Bring the gentleman a beer. I'm sure you've got a bottle under the counter. Check between the dead cats and the dried heads of your ex-boyfriends. This man, by the way, is your police chief. Don't be silly. The police chief has a bald spot the size of a toilet seat. So, as I were... Oh, I'm sorry, Eugene. It's Rogers. Probably forgot how to wipe his ass. <laughs> when you're 82, Troy, you'll probably forget you need to wipe your ass at all. But very well. Run along. We can continue without you. So, Mr. Boyd, as you may already know, the official job of my old friend Mr. Starr is to cause trouble for you. <laughs> but believe me, it's not out of malice. It's to maintain his cover at City Hall. But to somewhat balance out this trouble, I've decided to help you out. Every day, pay close attention to your morning newspaper, Mr. Boyd. You'll find messages hidden among the pages. Simple notes, but make no mistake, the information you'll find there is extremely useful. <laughs> you see, Troy Star isn't my only spy. Um... That's it, Mr. Boyd. 
I told you it would only take a couple of minutes. I wouldn't want to disturb you while you're enjoying your drink. Keep in touch, my dear little cupcake. <laughs> oh yes, I'm quite good at puns. Never imagined what meeting Robespierre would be like, but I certainly didn't figure the first thing he'd do is buy me a drink. Getting them to serve a beer at a family cafe? And this Robespierre has some strange superpowers. Strange, but not entirely useless.
9-11 in progress.
What's this, Martin? Think that'll cover breakfast? Good lord, Jack. You should knock. <laughs> don't worry, Martin. I don't care what kind of business you're up to. Although on second thought, scratch that. I'm very interested in your business. In fact, that's why I'm here. You have a lot of connections? Uh, depends on what you need. I want to keep my job. I've got another five years in me, at least. I want to prove my dismissal is illegal. You know someone who can help? Uh, Jack, are you sure you want to get involved in this... this fight? Martin, let's not, uh... Got yourself a new toy? Oh, you noticed, Martin. Just like a teenager. Always on the move. Yeah? Hello. Is this Mr. Boyd? Last I checked, who's this? And where did you get my personal number? Um... When you work at the prosecutor's office, it's not too hard to find someone's phone number. The prosecutor's office? Uh, just a second. Martin, out. I need to take this. But Jack, it's my office. Okay, okay, I understand. I'll go grab an ice cream. As for your little problem, Jack, I think we can work something out. Give me a couple of weeks. Weeks? Jack, what you're asking is... Yeah, okay, I get it. Now get out already. I'm sorry, what did you say your name was? I, um... My name is Lana. Lana Berman. I'm the deputy prosecutor of Freeburg. Well, one of the deputies. Not even the first deputy to tell you the truth. How can I help you, Miss Berman? Um... I don't know how to say this, Mr. Boyd. You see, Mr. Boyd, I I'm in line to be the next prosecutor of Freeburg, and, and apparently that's happening quite soon. Soon? Shea Broom was just re-elected for a new term. Yes, but she'll be resigning in February. She's... she's suffering from a heart condition, so she's chosen a replacement to carry out her term, and she chose me. You have no idea of the scandal, Mr. Boyd. I've only been at the prosecutor's office for half a year, and she chose me. It's incredible. That really is unbelievable, Miss Berman. Uh, but what's it got to do with me? Well, I understand how this call would seem strange to you, Mr. Boyd, but Mrs. Broom said she... Well, she said that you have a lot going on, but you're the most honest official in the city. And if I really want to change the city for the better, and I swear that's what I want, then I should meet you. I'm afraid Mrs. Broom was exaggerating. Oh, believe me, Mr. Boyd, Mrs. Broom is not one to exaggerate. I... I... I'm sorry, Mr. Boyd, I need to run. Do you mind if I... well, if I call you later? Do I mind? Hmm, let me think. <laughs> no, I don't mind, Miss Berman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boyd. Nine eleven in progress. Three eleven A complete.
Looks like we have a situation here.
Officer on scene. Looks like we have a situation here. I don't want to Mr. Boyd, I am Agent Avrahami, and this is Agent Roberts. You'll have to come with us. Uh, what now? Ugh. Please get dressed, Mr. Boyd. We'll wait for you in the car. Mr. Boyd, did you hear what I said? You know what? You boys can go to hell. I'm not going anywhere. Not right now, at least. You can come down to the police station during regular hours. You can't just come to my house while I'm sleeping, pull me out of bed without any breakfast. Right now, the only place I'm going is back to bed. I'm closing the door now, and if you... <laughs> Jack, what's all this? I told everyone what a great sport you are and how fun it would be to play a little joke on you. Where's your sense of humor gone? Ethan, it's five in the morning. At this hour, the only thing that'll get me laughing is one of you feds slipping on a banana peel. <laughs> well, what'd I tell you? He's such a joker. You're getting old, Ethan. You're getting fatter, Jack. And you're getting boring. And you're getting fired. Fine. You win. But you're still a snappy dresser, Jack. As I'm sure you can guess, we've got an assignment here in Freeburg. Come on, let's go. We'll fill you in at the scene.
Oh, and, uh, I really am glad to see you, Jack. You have no idea. Meet Jack. Now, this is Agent Shiresh, Agent Kumaro, Agent Ellis, and Agent Dixon. Jeez, how many men did you bring? Eleven people on my team, plus two heads, but they're still asleep at the hotel. We got to Freeburg a couple hours ago. Uh, actually, I was asked not to communicate with the local police, at least until the press conference, but, well, you're a friend. And by the way, you're lucky you didn't have time for breakfast. Now, the press are calling him The Dentist. Just like every other fucking maniac, he's got his own stupid nickname. We spent 19 years chasing this guy. The M.O. is always the same. He kills young women in a small town, drops out of sight, and then reappears on the other end of the country with a fresh set of victims. He kills without hesitation, stuns the victim, then strangles her while she's unconscious. And that's when things get fun. He uses a power tool to ream out the dead girl's mouth. For five years, we've heard nothing. That's the longest break he's ever taken. Then six hours ago, we got a crazy anonymous tip that the dentist was in Friedberg, and he'd already committed his first murder. They even told us the address of the house. It looks like our anonymous tip came from the dentist himself, but that hasn't been verified yet. Oh, uh, Dixon, don't go anywhere. So, Jack, listen. Dixon will take you to the station. You can bring your people up to speed. I'm looking forward to full cooperation, and it would be great if you could bag a criminal like this before you retire. A nice farewell. You know what I'm saying, Jack? Yeah, a nice farewell. And Dixon? Mr. Boyd will tell you where to take him. Come on, look alive. You're the police chief's driver today, if that's good enough for you. I'll come around to see you tonight. Buy us some beers, huh? But not that piss you normally drink. That stuff gives me wicked heartburn.
Officer on scene. Looks like we have a situation here. Eight eleven in progress. Nine eleven. Looks like we have a situation here.
So I went downstairs, figuring I'd find some mercenary or an escaped serial killer or some other lowlife I'd put away, right? But when I hit the lights, I saw a young kid. Couldn't have been 20. Skinny, dirty. Didn't even have a real weapon, just a rusty shiv. He just stood there, didn't say anything. My whole career, I've been staring down the most dangerous people in the country, and the only one to get into my house and scare my family to death was just some kid about to crap his pants. And I pointed my gun at him, and he just stood there with his mouth open. Bad luck for him. He was pretty lucky to still be alive. And you know what? It was you that saved him. I think you have me confused with somebody else, Ethan. No, 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 no. Listen. All these years, me and Marla joked about how dangerous my job is. We figured that sooner or later someone would sneak into our house and cut us to pieces, yeah? Pretty dark jokes, but innocent enough. And Marla asks me not to jump into gunfights when she kisses me on the cheek before I leave for work. It's like we figured that if we joke about stuff like that, then it'll never actually happen. But, um... Uh, while I trained my gun at the kid's nose, I finally realized someone really can get into our house. Someone really can cut us to pieces. Now that it finally happened, I can't make any more jokes like that. Marla won't laugh anymore. She'll burst into tears and stay in bed all day crying, hating me more and more every second. So I figured the only way out of the situation was to show her that if someone really does dare to break into our house... He's guaranteed to get a bullet in the face. He'll die right there on the living room carpet. God, Ethan, didn't know you were so bloodthirsty. I'm telling you, Jack, I was... ...serious about shooting this kid right there where he stood. I was about to pull the trigger. But then... I remembered you. Remembered, a uh, thousand years ago, we went to the lake and had some beers after an ethics lecture at the academy. I was all angry with that uh, professor, uh, Laszlo. Yeah. Remember what he always told us? Being a good policeman is very simple. You just need to keep doing the right thing. I hated those pretentious speeches. I cussed Laszlo up and down and said, if you always do what's right, you've turned yourself into a robot. And you just sat there. Drunk eyes staring. into the distance, and you were all calm and said, No, Ethan, it's the other way around. To do the right thing takes everything you got as a human. <laughs> I said that? Oh, what an idiot I was. Come on, Jack, it's not funny. When things get bad, it's those moments you gotta be hopeful and, and stay human. And I did just like you said. I stayed human. And then I slapped the cuffs on the kid in one quick move, just like Bobby Flash. Bobby Flash? What? You don't remember Evening Freeberg, the old news column? Stories about the cop hero Bobby Flash? 
I heard they even published a book a few years ago. Oh, that Bobby Flash. Yeah, that Bobby Flash. How can you not remember Bobby Flash? We all argued at junior high about which one of us would be Bobby Flash when he grows up. Oh, I'm no Bobby Flash. Hero Cop would never think about shooting a terrified teenager. Never think about shooting a terrified teenager. But wait a minute. If I'm not Bobby Flash, then maybe you are. Yeah, maybe so. Eleven eleven B in progress. Eleven eleven.
Boyd here, and I hope you have a hell of a good reason for calling me in the middle of the night. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Boyd. I'll, I'll call you back later. No, no, wait. You're the girl from the prosecutor's office. Lana, right? Yes, exactly. Oh, I'm so embarrassed, Mr. Boyd. The first thing Mrs. Broom told me about you is that you almost never sleep. I don't sleep too much either, so I thought I'd call you and apologize for last time. <laughs> but it wasn't the last time, was it? Well, I I've been going over our conversation in my mind, and I realized how stupid I sounded. You're the chief of police, and there's a strange girl calling you, saying she'll be the next city prosecutor, just... just to share the news, I guess. I must have sounded crazy. 
Not so crazy as you imagine, Lana. Uh, when I learned I was going to be police chief, my parents were already dead and my only friend was working a thousand miles away from Freeburg. Wife and kids were relaxing on a distant island in the middle of the ocean. Took me six hours to get a hold of them. But I had to share the news with someone or I would have gone mad. All the more because I was surrounded by half a dozen cops who figured they were ahead of me for the job. I figured you were feeling about the same. It's like you're reading my mind. Now I'm like an outcast here. Most of them still think that Mrs. Broom was joking or trying to show her deputies that she's in charge of appointing her successor. But I know it's no joke. Well, for some reason I didn't doubt it, Lana. That's probably why I'm calling you. I know it's selfish. I'm sure your wife isn't too keen on girls calling you at night. My wife and I, well, we're not living together. Maybe I'm the loneliest man in town, and that's why you called, to talk to someone even lonelier than you, huh? <laughs> Lana? You know, Mr. Boyd, maybe I'm an idiot, but until this moment, I didn't realize how lonely I am. Well, you're in luck, because now you can call me anytime. Uh, but if you do, you'll have to call me Jack. Jack? <laughs> It'll take more than one phone call to get used to that. Well, we're not in a hurry, are we? True.
Boyd. Well, finally, Jack. I've been dying to reach you these past two weeks, but I thought I should give you some time to recover your strength. How are you feeling? Better than ever, Mr. Sand, touched by your concern. Well, I hope this doesn't sound too sentimental, Jack. But while you were laying in a coma, I thought about our last meeting many times. It was such a fascinating conversation. You said it yourself. You're a true hunter. Ah, uh, no, Mr. Sand, it was you who said that. Was it? Well, it doesn't matter. What is important, Kendrick told me a lot about you, Jack. But I suddenly realized that he didn't give me the whole story. Why is it you only want half? What are you talking about? Well, why is it you only want to make half? Not a whole million, just half. Not one hundred thousand, but five. It's a very specific figure. How did you arrive at that number? Well, I was looking at a house a couple hours outside of Freeburg, down the river. 
I figured to buy it, move the family, and set everything up, I'd need right around 500,000. It's not my style to take more than I need. Ah. I must admit, Jack, I imagined all sorts of reasons, but none of them were close to the truth. Are you disappointed, Mr. Sand? No, 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 not with you, Jack. Quite the contrary. I respect you even more. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Mr. Sand. And now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go home and get some sleep. Of course, Jack. I just... Oh yeah, the work is definitely piling on. <laughs> Truth is, if I didn't have Palmer helping me catch this psycho, I don't know what I'd do. Yeah. You know, when he got here, I... And the stuff the newspapers are saying, is it true? What are the newspapers saying? The girl who was killed. She filed a sexual harassment complaint against the mayor. What about the other victims? Were they harassed by the mayor too? Well, it, it's hard to say. Is it true? So far, the mayor's the only thing we have connecting the victims, but only one of them filed a complaint against him, and she withdrew it a few days later. Someone must have pressured her, but uh, it's hard to say anything for sure. But is it true? Do you think it's true? Well, let's just say it seems like it might be. What's the matter? The mayor raped me. Can you repeat that? The mayor of Freeburg, Stuart Rogers? He raped me. You heard me right. When did this happen? Four and a half years ago when I was just out of college. They gave a reception for us at City Hall. Rogers gave a speech and there were a few other speakers then dinner. I drank the champagne, it was hot out, the music was loud. I was feeling dizzy so I went to take a breath in a quiet corner. I found a conference room then a few minutes later the mayor came in with his guard. Rogers whispered something to the guard, and the guard left. I, I didn't have time to figure out what was going on. Rogers just walked up to me, grabbed me by the throat, and squeezed, and then he began to rape me. This went on. It lasted about ten minutes. Look, Lana, it would be very difficult to prove anything at this point, but You it... wouldn't have to prove anything. I have a videotape. A video? A recording from a surveillance camera. A cassette. 
the raping mayor, sitting in my closet next to Kramer versus Kramer. But how... Six months after it happened, someone slipped the cassette under my door. This was the same time the city administrator, Mary Simmons, was dismissed. Quite a scandal, if you recall. I think that must have to do with it. Lana, don't, don't worry about a thing. We'll use this tape and ambush the bastard. No, we're not going to do that. Lana, listen to me. You need it's to... It's been four years. Don't you think I've had time to think things through? I already decided I'm not pressing charges. Lana, whatever you've been thinking, I promise you, it would be better if No, you... it wouldn't be better. For the past few years, I've worked hard so that people would take me seriously, so they'd respect me as a professional. If I step forward now, I ruin all my efforts, my whole future, and I'll destroy my one chance to make this city better. I'll be a sympathy case, I'll be humiliated, and then I'll be attacked. And the one thing I won't ever get again is respect. Lana, you're talking about covering up a crime. I'm doing it because I know it's the right thing to do. Then you're a fool! Oh my god, I, I just... I made a mistake. Just forget everything I said. Lana. L Lana! Shit. Shit! <laughs>
progress. Officer on scene. Looks like we have a situation here. Two fourteen. Yeah, understood. Thank you very much, Walt. Sorry again for waking you up. Give my regards to Jean. Okay, got gotta run. H hey, Martin, wait a minute. Martin, you still hang around with uh, Bo Berenger? Of course. In fact, he's my stepfather. Great. Think he has a couple of men available? Today? Right now, in fact? There's something important I need taken care of. Um, sure. Something you need help moving? Uh, not exactly. Here's the address. I need this house watched. All day and all night until I say stop. If anyone suspicious goes poking around, tie him up and bring him here. I'll pay double the usual rate. Or triple, whatever he needs. And nobody else knows about this, right? Jack, they're more into looking after valuables, not houses. What's the difference? Well, these guys probably wouldn't care either way. Okay, Jack, no problem. I'll make the call. As for your retirement, I've been... Uh, let's focus on today, Martin. Now keep that house secure, all right? Okay, okay, I have a phone in the car. I'll call Bo right away. I appreciate it, Martin. Believe me. I do. Hey, Jack. Yeah? Anything else I need to know about this? Uh, no. Better you don't. Hello? I'm an addict. Please, I don't want... Listen to me, Lana. R I really am an addict. For 20 years now, give or take. I've been lying to myself that I'm in control of the situation, and sometimes it really seems like I am, but sometimes in the more desperate moments, I become completely dependent on the pills. And it's just dumb luck that I haven't killed myself. Or someone else. More than a few times, I've come pretty close. I've been stoned while I'm driving was even stoned once during a firefight. I've been on drugs while I made decisions where dozens of lives were on the line. When I'm overworked, I need the pills. That's my problem. It's my weakness. But I always knew that if I admit my weakness, if I start talking about the problem publicly, if I go to rehab, then I'm already as good as retired. They'll take advantage of the scandal and get rid of me forever. It doesn't matter all the good work I'm trying to do at the police department. They'll just bury me. So I'm keeping my problem a secret, at least until I can retire. I have to. I know it's the right thing to do. You realize, Jack, this is the first time you ever called me? What? You called me this time. I thought you were just waiting for me to stop bugging you, but now you called me and you opened up, even though you didn't have to. <laughs> Maybe you're stoned? What? I... <laughs> no, I'm not stoned right now. 
Well, Jack, I guess you need me as much as I need you. I need you more than you need me. Now I know you're stoned. Lana, I'm... You were... I heard everything you said, Jack. I understood everything just fine. You don't need to say anything else. Right, exactly. Say no more.
Officer on scene, looks like we have a situation here.
Progress. Progress. Thank 
9-11 in progress. progress.
Officer on scene. Looks like we have a situation here. Eleven eleven. Got a situation here. Four twelve eight.
well. Down in progress.
Okay, complete. 